Whenever you wish to start recording, and I see you're recording, yep. there we go. Uh, we can start uh, doing that. And again, I just want to apologize to everybody, although it was yet another natural disaster up here. Uh, a week ago, Wednesday, we had an enormous um, windstorm with squalls of rain, and we thought it was a local power outage, but we then found out it affected an enormous uh, area in the central eastern upstate area. So I did not get power back until um, until um, a very late Thursday. And um, I, in fact, in order to send out an email to all of you, I had to drive up to the top of a mountain to get text service to send it to you. So in any case, what we're going to do is make up that uh, make up that uh, class somewhere later in the semester, uh, hopefully either in late November or the, obviously the latest early December. So I know you all have a very active WeChat or interactive group, um, and what would be ideal is that if we could find. Uh, some day or time, and by the way, when I say day or time, it could be any of seven days of a week and uh, any time. Uh, let me put it this way. I don't think I'm going to be lecturing from 10 p.m. to 1 a.m., but uh, I, I can go into early evening or whatever uh, uh, you know, to do this class. So if we can find a time where everybody uh, is available, uh, we can do that. Um, uh, the other alternative is do a second synchronous uh, class. But in any case, whatever class I will do, I will have it recorded and then I'll try to work with people uh, individually in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, going on. So uh, the other major thing is, um, I uh, understand that all of you would like to receive the exam, uh, part two of the exam, uh, sometime tomorrow. So then you would be returning it to me uh, via Word, you know, in a Word document um, on, on, uh, 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 by Tuesday. Uh, now, um, I have two really uh, interesting choices here, uh, one that's based on trust and the other one which is just sort of straightforward. Um, this is an open book exam, okay? Um, so you can use whatever materials uh, that, uh, 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 that are at your disposal in order to answer the questions and a lot of the questions are going to be very, very straightforward. What I'm hoping that you're not going to do is just plain cut and paste, you know, like, so for instance, if you were to answer something about the cranial nerves and just go to my PowerPoint presentation, uh, cut out my <laughs> things on cranial nerve and paste it in, I'm not sure how much that helps you. Uh, one thing I've been teaching for over 40 years and I've been teaching from anywhere from advanced doctoral courses, obviously, to Psych 101. In fact, um, uh, uh, my wife, when she did her dissertation, uh, 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 did uh, work on uh, uh, looking at stress and looking at stressful events and things like that. And what she, what she used as the stressor was uh, uh, students in my Psych 101 class taking my exams, okay? So I was considered a stressor there. Uh, but in, in, any, in any case, whenever I gave a, um, whenever I gave a, a Psych 101 course, one of the things that I found is that students that were having real trouble after a couple of exams, by the way, I'll, I'll go on a little bit here. Uh, what I typically do is give in Psych 101, 
uh, three exams and uh, I weight them so that whatever, whatever exam the student does the best on, that's 45% of the grade. Then what they do second best on is 35% of the grade. Then what they do worst on is worth 20% of the grade. So if you have a bad hair day, it, it doesn't really kill you. And what I found was is at the end of two exams, um, I had people that were still not doing well. And um, what I basically did was I gave them extra point types of things where they literally had to sit there and write out and summarize uh, whatever uh, 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 you know particular things in the book that would then go on to the exam. And of course, what I found is that A, a lot of the students took advantage of that. And then I think started to develop some uh, 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 study skills. What I basically find is, is that active learning is an extremely important thing. And it's an extremely important thing here in neuroanatomy, you doing the actual stuff. So uh, very much in this exam, uh, what uh, I'm almost thinking a second idea is that you handwrite it out, although then you sit there and you try to read out, read the handwriting or something. But in a lot of cases, there'll be diagramming. So you'll be diagramming and labeling and things like that. So I'm hoping that that is going to be the part, uh, part of the exam. I'm just asking you, uh, don't uh, cut and paste. So if I ask you something about the spinothalamic tracts. I hope you don't give me the pictures of the two spinothalamic tracts and uh, say, well, here it is. Um, uh, you know, I would hope that you would do something more than that because I do believe that it's important in terms of, of your learning. So in any case, there'll be plenty of uh, explanation when I send all of you uh, the exam and uh, what to do and by when to send back the, um, uh, the, uh, 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 that part two. With part one, um, we've been moving the pace. I think about maybe a little less than a third of you have taken um, uh, the exam. And I basically give people an hour uh, to do this. But what I've been finding is that people have been pretty much finishing the exam somewhere between 25 and 35 minutes. And then we can have like a little bit of a brief chat afterwards. So that is, um, uh, uh, that's moving the pace. And I have everybody's, um, uh, everybody uh, loaded up. I'll be doing uh, three exams this afternoon uh, with you. And then I think on Monday, I do eight exams. So that's eight hours of asking the same question over and over again. But again, um, I'm hoping that uh, you're doing it. I really understand with the first time that you take the exam, people are nervous. Um, please reassure each other that I do take, uh, you know, I'm not asking you to give me an answer within three microseconds, although there's some people that do that. And, but what I always love about uh, doing a verbal exam is uh, I love to watch in a, 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 on a, after I watch all those news shows in the evening, I always love to watch Jeopardy. And what I always like is when 80% uh, uh, of people who answer my question, answer my question in the form of a question. So if I point at something, they go, Yes, is that the, uh, or, or, uh, or at least they say the words, but they say it questioning <laughs> and everything. But uh, uh, so I'm very, very used to that. Okay. One last thing that I'm not going to get into today, because I think we have so many other things to go on and, and uh, talk about is next week, I will talk and I will create a, uh, a little thing that I will send out to you. Uh, regarding uh, the paper, because um, again, uh, uh, you, uh, I want the pay. Uh, I want you to have time to do the paper, and not that you're doing it all the way at the end where you have other exams and whatever. So, uh, so with that, 
what I'm going to do. Is there, does anybody have any kinds of questions about we're going to make up that class, number one. Number two, um, a part two is going to be sent out. So if you don't receive the email, please uh, write back and say, hey, I haven't received this. Um, and then um, uh, uh, about the paper. And um, so with any other questions. OK, hearing none. We'll now move on. So um, two weeks ago, uh, uh, we were going through the medulla and um, moved through all of those transition areas. And again, uh, when we're looking at the spinal cords of the medulla, sort of like that way, when you looked in the upper cervical cord and all of a sudden saw the pyramidal decussations decussating, um, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, very often when you're not looking at things, you have the idea that uh, these arbitrary names happen abruptly. So what we basically saw is that moving from the spinal cord into the medulla, four different things happen. Number one is that the uh, dorsal, uh, uh, the dorsomedial septum and the central canal will eventually merge to become the fourth ventricle as we move rostrally. Number two, the well-formed uh, dorsal and ventral horns uh, now start to May, uh, uh, form what we basically call the reticular formation. Then number three, what we see is that the um, lateral corticospinal tract and anterior corticospinal tract uh, in the spinal cord, um, all of a sudden you see the decussation of, of the pyramids. And then what you basically now see the pyramids as we move rostrally assume the inferior surface of the medulla. And then the fourth is that we basically see these, uh, this very, very uh, large uh, fiber tract, the dorsal columns uh, made up of the fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus eventually synapse into the nucleus gracilis and the nucleus cuneatus and then the, uh, the second order axons of the nucleus gracilis and nucleus cuneatus form the internal arcuate fibers that curl around the central canal and then do their decussation so they can ascend through the medial lemniscus. So in this particular slide where we ended the last time and I spent quite a bit of time on it, at least the uh, uh, you know, this uh, schematic is again, what we're still seeing is um, uh, 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 three different aspects of what we now call, uh, uh, actually two uh, specific aspects of what we call the medulla. What we basically see here is we see a corticospinal tract and no longer the decussation of the pyramids because that happened quarterly. The other thing we now see is a well-developed um, reticular formation. And we started to identify a lot of these structures. What's still there, however, is you still see, even though this is a caudal medullary section, we still see a, a central canal. But you notice that the central canal is drifting as we move rostrally uh, superiorly. And the second thing that you notice is that the dorsomedial septum is now starting to open. So eventually what's gonna happen is the central canal will join with the dorsomedial septum and you'll have a chevron shape um, that then basically forms the horizontally aligned fourth ventricle. So when we look at this here, we're still seeing some um, uh, spinal structures. So out over here, we still have 
the nucleus gracilis, and we have the nucleus cuneatus. However, what we now see very clearly is that we have an extremely well-defined nucleus gracilis, and we saw that the nucleus gracilis came in a bit more quarterly than the emerging a nucleus cuneatus. And of course, we know that the nucleus gracilis is receiving what types of input, input? It's receiving sacral input, it's receiving lumbar input, and it's receiving some lower thoracic input. And the nucleus cuneatus is of course receiving upper thoracic input and it's receiving cervical input. Now, when we were back in the spinal cord, what we recognized is that the lumbar and the thoracic parts of the cord not only supplied input into uh, 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 brain structures, including the cortex and the thalamus and whatever, uh, through the dorsal column system, through the anterior spinothalamic tract, or through the lateral spinothalamic tract, but they also provided cerebellar input, notably in the thoracic cord, anywhere from about L1 all the way up to uh, around C8, you had this well-defined nucleus in the base of the dorsal horn called the nucleus of Clark. And as we learned, the nucleus of Clark uh, provides uh, two types of output. One output uh, forms what is called the posterior spinocerebellar tract. And what that did is leave the, leave the nucleus of Clark uh, laterally, uh, uh, laterally and unilaterally, and then ascend ipsilaterally up until it gets into the uh, inferior cerebellar peduncle, which is seen here. And then what we also saw is that the, uh, the columns of Clark uh, or nucleus of Clark uh, sends out a second output that decussates across the anterior white commissure and then forms the anterior spinocerebellar tract, which ascends through the spinal cord, through the medulla, through the pons, and then as it gets into the caudal midbrain, enters the superior cerebellar peduncle, where it decussates a second time, and then descends back into the pons, where it enters into the cerebellum. So the cerebellum is basically receiving from those two inputs, ipsilateral input, versus when we think of cortical uh, inputs, it's basically contralateral. Now, so the big question is, how do we get uh, spinal input into the cerebellum uh, at the thoracic level? And the point is, it uses a different pathway. And that is that not only is there a nucleus cuneatus, but there is a more lateral accessory cuneate nucleus. So here is the accessory cuneate nucleus. And the accessory cuneate nucleus is now going to provide ipsilateral input into the cerebellum through its axons coming out of the uh, uh, um, accessory cuneate nucleus called the cuneocerebellar tract. And it will be the second major pathway that we know that comprises the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Okay, so we have gone through nuclear, uh, fasciculus and nucleus gracilis, fasciculus and nucleus cuneatus, and the accessory cuneate nucleus in the cuneocerebellar tract. Now what we see is even though we have a central canal, we are now starting to form what we call a periventricular gray. And what is found in the periventricular gray is um, the uh, 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 medially 
is the 12th cranial nerve, as I pointed out in the last class. And of course, as you learn, the 12th cranial nerve, the hypoglossal nerve, is uh, a motor nerve, and that's symbolized by the dot of the basically the cell. Uh, and it's exiting the brain medially. And of course, the 12th cranial nerve is controlling the posterior two thirds of the tongue. Then as we look lateral, even though it looks dorsal on this surface here, is we have the largest cranial nerve out here in the caudal medulla, which of course is the vagus nerve. And as you learn, the 10th cranial nerve of vagus is a mixed cranial nerve. So it has both a sensory component and a motor component. And one of the things that we can see here is something that's common for all mixed cranial nerves. The, the nucleus of a mixed uh, a nucleus, the motor nucleus of a mixed cranial nerve is going to appear medial to the sensory. So M is for medial, uh, 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 the more lateral portion of that mixed cranial nerve is sensory. So you see the sensory vagus and you see the motor vagus. And as you know, the motor vagus uh, and the sensory branch uh, enters and exits the brain laterally. So you can see that there. And of course, it will, they will basically use the same, same foramen to get out. Now, in common here, we also have another cranial nerve, the 11th cranial nerve. And of course, that's the smallest of the cranial nerves, the spinal accessory, and it is um, a motor nerve. And as I pointed out, as a, what sounded like a piece of trivia at the time, is that the uh, spinal accessory nerve basically shares the same trajectory as the vagus and uses the same foramen. And what we can basically see is although the 12th and the 10th cranial nerves are in this periventricular zone, okay, what we can basically see with the 11th cranial nerve is it's sort of out here, uh, out here alone. And it's out in this area that we basically call a reticular formation, a very vague looking area that has lots and lots of fibers going through and small nuclei. And again, a sort of notable answer to this of what is the name of the 11 cranial nerves nucleus is that it is the nucleus ambiguous. So you can basically see the 11 cranial nerve here. And of course, what we have here is reticular formation. I'll talk about that in a little bit. So then what we then move down to is when we were looking more quarterly and even around here, what you would basically see is the axons of the nucleus gracilis and the nucleus cuneatus, those second order axons, uh, leaving the nucleus. And what they do is they form a bow around the central canal. And we call those fibers going around the bow as what we call the internal arcuate fibers. And of course, what they do is they come down. Okay, I lost my point. There we go. Uh, uh, they come down and they decussate under the central canal or under the ventricle and they form the medial lemniscus. So this sort of sock looking like structure here is the medial lemniscus. So one of the things that we saw in a previous slide is that the two medial lemnisci were right next to each other. But what's, what's gonna happen to that uh, medial lemniscus? You have to recognize that that medial lemniscus is eventually um, going to uh, move all the way up to the ventro-posterolateral nucleus of the thalamus. So it's gonna move from its medial position uh, uh, more laterally. And we're gonna see that as we go all the way through the medulla pons and midbrain. In the medulla, you can basically see the medial lemniscus 
as being vertically aligned. And here it's a little separated. And what you now have between it is a, uh, a very uh, interesting medullary nucleus. And that's called, the, uh, this is uh, the Raffae nuclei. Now, there are nine Raffae nuclei and they are all found right along uh, this midline. Um, they basically, they, uh, and they can be found in the medulla, in the pons, and in the midbrain. The ones that are in the medulla and the pons primarily will descend down into the spinal cord and, uh, and exert degrees of control. The very interesting thing about the Raffae nuclei is that about one third of the cells, and here in the medulla, these cells um, are serotonergic. So what they do is they descend down into the uh, spinal cord. And some of the Raffae nuclei uh, will descend into the intermediate zone or into the uh, pericanola gray. Others will descend into the dorsal horn. And a subgroup of the fibers that go down into the dorsal horn that contain serotonin synapse in lamina two and lamina five of the spinal cord. And what they do is they basically synapse presynaptically. So now think about lamina two and lamina five and the type of information that is provided there. The, uh, a very powerful aspect that, of that is nociceptive information, the input about pain. So here are these serotonergic fibers coming down and synapsing on the incoming fibers of the uh, uh, in lamina two and lamina five. And what these serotonergic fibers uh, 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 the release of serotonin into the dorsal horn, lamina two and lamina five, results in inhibition. So what you basically have here is a descending pain inhibitory system that in a way that how the brain is going to modulate pain. And in fact, within the Raffae, especially the medullary Raffae, uh, there have been three types of neurophysiologically identified cells. One set of cells are called on cells. Another set of cells are called off cells. And a third set of cells are called neutral cells. And what are we, what are we talking about here? Is that within, with an on cell, and the type of the type of uh, 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 the a major stimulus that can excite an on cell is the is an opiate, either the opiate morphine or the endogenous opioid peptides like the encephalins, uh, 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 the endorphins, and dynorphin. They can, uh, 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 they can activate an on cell. And that on cell then goes down uh, and a large number of them are serotonergic, goes down and then inhibits um, the incoming nociceptive information coming into lamina two and lamina five. So what you have here is a powerful endogenous pain inhibitory system. Um, and believe me, I've been studying, uh, although my work now is primarily on feeding, in the first uh, 30 years of my career, I basically studied this uh, pain inhibitory system uh, in a, a number of different ways through microinjection studies and whatever. Okay, so that's the Raffae nuclei right here. And then we have if we look at this as sort of a little Christmas stocking and we have sort of an egg sticking out of the Christmas stocking, this is actually a fiber track we're looking at. And this is the medial longitudinal fasciculus or MLF. 
The MLF is a set of fibers that come out of the medial vestibular nucleus in the rostral medulla. And then what the fibers do is they bifurcate. They descend down all the way down into the caudal medulla. And then they, they uh, go rostrally all the way up into the middle of the midbrain. And what basically is happening here is that the MLF is providing a real-time vestibular information, not coming out of the cerebellum, just coming out of the vestibular cochlea information that is coming in and is, is integrating things about body position and you know the orientation of the head, the orientation of the body, whether you're lying, whether you're sitting, uh, and whatever, all along the neuraxis from the caudal medulla all the way up into the middle of the midbrain. And the big area that you're going to see here is when these with when this MLF is now going to interact with uh, the third fourth and sixth cranial nerves, which of course controls eye muscles. So we did that silly little uh, game a couple of weeks ago where I basically asked you to follow, um, uh, 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 follow uh, uh, you know, track laterally, or uh, I mean, laterally or medially with your eyes as something moves across, but then move your head to the side. And now you realize that you're tracking superiorly and uh, uh, superiorly and inferiorly. So the point of the matter uh, is, um, uh, this is the way this uh, raw uh, 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 vestibular information having to do with balance comes in. So then, of course, we saw the corticospinal tract. And now when we look in the lower part of the reticular formation, we then have this other very curious looking set of structures. And of course, this is the principal nucleus, the dorsal accessory nucleus, and the medial accessory nucleus of the, infer uh, of the inferior olivary complex. And this principal nucleus has a uh, interesting horseshoe shape to it. And the actual space within the horseshoe is given a name, sort of like the way we name the uncus as a bump around the parahippocampal gyrus. This space here is called the hilus. So you can sort of recognize the hilus uh, very often. And so uh, this inferior olivary complex is going to get lots of input coming in from uh, the corticobulbar tract. And this inferior olivary complex will give rise to two fiber tracts. They're, co uh, they're collectively known as the olivocerebellar tract. And they come up and they become the third major uh, fiber tract that comprises the inferior cerebellar peduncle. So this information is coming in ipsilaterally. And what are the two types of fibers that we can see coming out of the olivocerebellar tract? And the first are called climbing fibers. And these fibers make very specific and uh, uh, discrete connections on, uh, on the cells in the, the second layer of the cerebellum, the Purkinje cells. And the Purkinje cells you're gonna learn are gonna be the major outputs of the cerebellum. And whenever a Purkinje cell fires, it is exerting very strong inhibition on whatever its synapse is on. So what the climbing fibers essentially do, coming out of the inferior olivary complex, is they are exciting, highly specific inhibition uh, uh, by the Purkinje cells. 
and we'll explain this a lot further. The second type of fiber that is in the olivocerebellar tract coming out of the inferior olivary complex is what are known as mossy fibers. And mossy fibers come up and they synapse very globally uh, in uh, the third layer of the cerebellum. And eventually the cells they synapse on then will send input up to the first layer of the cerebellum where they then uh, uh, basically inhibit Purkinje cells. So the climbing fibers are exciting Purkinje cells in a highly specific manner, whereas the Morsi fibers are inhibiting uh, Purkinje cells in a more global manner. So we have, a, we have a lot of systems here. So one of the things that you have to go and recognize is in neuroanatomy, I am trying to teach you where everything is relative to one another. But you're going to have to go and recognize very quickly that although something is right next to something else, these things may have absolutely nothing to do with one another. And that what we're basically learning about is the engagement of a number of different sis, uh, systems, just like we saw with the logic of how the spinal cord is organized. Okay, so now here we go to um, uh, some of uh, just some further points here. The caudal medullary cranial nerves. We saw immediately in a so-called emerging periventricular zone, the hypoglossal nucleus, the motor nucleus, that's medial to the sensory nucleus of the vagus, and then the spinal accessory outputs uh, of the nucleus ambiguous sharing the same foramina as the tenth. So here we are, we see that again. And we saw the caudal medullary fibers, the pyramids and pyramidal decussation with the medial lemniscus. And then we saw the outputs of the medial vestibular nucleus and the rostral medulla forming the MLF, okay? And we now just covered here the principal nucleus of the inferior olivary complex in the hilus, the dorsal and medial accessory nucleus, and the fact that there are corticobulbar and spinoreticular inputs uh, innervating the uh, inferior olivary complex. And these olivocerebellar fibers uh, are either climbing fibers or Morsi fibers. So the point is that we have basically learned that there are three peduncles entering or exiting the uh, cerebellum. And that what we can see is that the most caudal of them, the inferior cerebellar peduncle or restiform body is comprised, it has other fiber tracts of course, but I can't get to every one. Um, the posterior spinocerebellar tract, the cuneocerebellar tract and the olivocerebellar tract are providing ipsilateral input into the cerebellum. So now what we're going to be doing is looking at a mid-medullary section and the emergence of the fourth ventricle. And again, now we want to keep paying attention to the 10th, 11th, and 12th uh, cranial nerve nuclei. And then what we're going to see is something that we call ventricular eminences. Because when you're looking grossly at a mid-medullary section, you're not looking at the nuclei themselves. You have to see them under a microscope. But what you can see are sort of little bumps. Uh, and that's what we call the ventricular eminences. And then we're going to see another very interesting type of uh, nucleus and fiber tract called the nucleus tractus solitarius. We will then uh, continue to look at the medial lemniscus and, and MLF. We'll look at the midline uh, nuclei, the RAPE, 
and then the uh, inferior olive, very complex olives and pyramids. So here we go. And finally, when we reach the mid medulla, we basically start to see uh, something that sort of looks like a fourth ventricle. So look at what basically has happened. Let's look at what is no longer there. What is no longer there? There's no more dorsomedial septum. There's no more central canal. Why? Because we have a horizontally organized fourth ventricle. What else is no longer there? Because we have a horizontally organized fourth ventricle, we no longer see what? The nucleus uh, gracilis or nucleus cuneatus or the fasciculus gracilis or fasciculus cuneatus. Why? Because they're caudal to it. In fact, when we basically looked, if you go back to your gross brain and you go and you look at the superior surface and you see without the telencephalon, you see that a thing called the obex, which is sort of an ending of the fourth ventricle. And right behind that would be the gracile and cuneate nuclei. They are caudal to this. So when we're looking at the fourth ventricle, what we can see is that there's a scalloping to the fourth ventricle, especially on its uh, ventral surface. The most, the most medial scallop is called the median, uh, the median eminence of the fourth ventricle. The middle scallop is the intermediate eminence and the uh, more lateral scallop is the lateral eminence. And if you notice here that under the median eminence, uh, the median eminence of the fourth ventricle, we can see the 12th cranial nerve. Under the intermediate eminence, eminences, you can see the motor nucleus of the 10th. And then under the lateral eminence, you can see the sensory branch of the 10th. So we basically see fourth ventricle, uh, hypoglossal nerve, motor nerve of the vagus, sensory nerve of the vagus. Then what we see is the, is the uh, motor 12th exiting medially, the motor and sensory 10th entering and exiting laterally, and sharing the same foramen with the 11th cranial nerve. What we now see out over here is, of course, the inferior cerebellar peduncle. And the inferior cerebellar peduncle is still getting input from the olivocerebellar tract uh, down here, but it is carrying what? The posterior spinocerebellar tract and the cuneocerebellar tracts. Okay, so now, again, what do I see here uh, in my free associations is instead of seeing a sock, we now start to see uh, two sardines sort of stuck together. So we have the head of the sardine and the body and the tail of the sardine. So what do I see as the head of the sardine? What do we have here is the MLF. Notice that the MLF versus a couple of slides ago was a little bit more uh, inferior. Here you're seeing it's coming closer to the fourth ventricle because when we get into the rostral medulla, what we're gonna have is the MLF is gonna be coming out of the uh, uh, medial vestibular nucleus. So there is the MLF. And here is the medial lemniscus. And now what we can see is we have more raffe nuclei. This is still uh, medullary raffe nuclei right here. And what we can still see right here, uh, uh, staying in place, of course, is the, um, is, is the uh, pyramids. Now, when we look at this reticular formation, and especially if we start to look out here, all we see is reticulated cells, okay? So just keep that in mind for a second because 
this area out here is going to form within the reticular formation something called the nucleus tractus solitarius. So, um, so what what do I conjure up here? This is going to be the first of two examples of donuts in the brain. So. What is a donut? And I know when I grew up, there were things of donuts. Now, in the last 25 to 30 years, we now have the complicating thing of donut holes. But I want you to think about a donut. A donut has its cakey material on the outside, and in the middle, there is a hole. So the nucleus tractus solitarius the nucleus is the sort of the makeup of the donut, okay? The cells of the nucleus tractus solitarius it, uh, on the left side and the right side is donut shaped. And instead, how, do, how does that nucleus then send out its fibers? They send their fibers in medially to one another to form the tractus solitarius, because the tract is isolated from the rest of the brain by its own nucleus. So the NTS, the, the tract, is going to be ascending. Now, it is in the nucleus tractus solitarius is an interesting second order type of of system that is going to be integrating a bunch of information. So now we have to start to think about um, uh, the, the uh, different cranial nerves. The 10th cranial nerve is has in its subdiaphragmatic branch, visceral digestive signals. In its um, supra, uh, 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 supra uh, diaphragmatic branch, it is containing respiratory and some cardiovascular types of signals. So the, the more medial and more caudal part of the nucleus tractus solitarius is getting its massive amount of information from both the supradiaphragmatic respiratory cardiovascular and subdiaphragmatic uh, digestive vagus, okay? So the vagus nerve, uh, that sensory branch is now sending a whole bunch of visceral digestive signals uh, up to this uh, nucleus as well as respiratory and cardiovascular signals. So now the nucleus tractus solitarius is going to ascend. And what I'm going to do, although this slide talks mostly about the digestive signals, I'm going to cover both. One part of the NTS will ascend just a little bit and then it will veer off and go into the ventrolateral medulla, the ventrolateral medulla, okay? And in the ventrolateral medulla, what you basically are controlling, what is being controlled out there is a, a, a central brain control over cardiovascular systems and over respiratory systems. So I'm also very fond that when we basically talk about uh, the cortex, you know, when we identify these uh, different large parts of the cortex and basically start to say um, that we have uh, the so-called uh, executive area for controlling 
expressive speech or receptive speech or, or this particular function or that particular function. And then you look at the size of, of those areas. Um, uh, you know, when you start to use the word, well, this is the decision making or the executive thing. Uh, uh, yes, it is in some way, shape or form, but it's, it's billions of neurons. Now, uh, so, and what you can always do for a lot of you who wish to become clinical neuropsychologists is basically go and do various types of assessments, either through paper and pencil to test, through uh, symptomatology or looking at fMRI to determine uh, various uh, problems. Now I want to bring you out to the ventrolateral medulla, which you know, as compared to uh, uh, you know, a part of the uh, a part of let's say the inferior frontal gyrus pause uh, 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 pause orbitalis, we can take two or three fingers and sort of touch that area. Think about the very very tip of your pinky touching the ventral lateral medulla, and basically saying that's where the destruction is. If you were to do a neuropsychological test to a person in the ventral lateral medulla uh, who had lesions bilaterally the ventral lateral medulla, uh, how would these people do on that neuropsychological test? They get a zero. Why? Because in the immortal words of Monty Python and their parrot sketch, these people are extinct, they're dead, they're beyond the th whatever. It's because way out there in the ventral lateral medulla, you are basically controlling the neural mechanisms that are uh, producing uh, uh, either increased or decreased respiration or increased or decreased heart rate or increased or decreased blood pressure. And that uh, this part of the brain that is mediated through the uh, nucleus tractus solitarius to uh, modulate uh, things, uh, especially through the vagus, but also the seventh and ninth cranial nerves is controlling that. So now the, nucle uh, the, nucle uh, the, uh, the medial portion and caudal portion of the NTS is controlling, is getting its inputs primarily from the vagus. The lateral and rostral uh, portions of the NTS are getting enormous inputs from the seventh and the ninth cranial nerves. So what you're basically dealing with there is with the, uh, let's go through the uh, di uh, digestive aspects with the, uh, with the, uh, the seventh cranial nerve, you're basically controlling um, the, uh, the first two thirds of the tongue and the whole thing having to do with taste. And the ninth cranial nerve, you're basically controlling uh, the pharynx in terms of being able to go and swallow and get food into the trachea, uh, 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 into, into the esophagus, not the trachea, okay? Uh, and of course, what you're basically doing there is controlling as to whether or not you're uh, uh, inspiring or expiring air uh, you want to basically use the trachea, whereas if you're ingesting food, you want to use uh, the esophagus and uh, the pharynx. So uh, uh, all of this integration comes in, and that is also uh, uh, brought into the nucleus tractus solitarius, and the respiratory portion of that is going into the um, ventrolateral medulla. So the type of inspiration that you're doing, the positioning of the larynx and the pharynx and the opening of the trachea and everything happens there. But now in digestive signals, what do you now recognize? That the nucleus tractus solitarius is taking three disparate inputs. It is taking inputs from the seventh cranial nerve having to do with taste, the ninth cranial nerve 
that has to do with the uh, basic um, swallowing of food and inserting it into the esophagus. And then the 10th cranial nerve, which is controlling the esophagus, the stomach, the, uh, the intestines, the liver, and all of that. So all of these digestive signals. So when one looks at feeding, um, what we basically do is we look at two different uh, components of feeding. And very often we pay a lot of attention as psychologists to the one part of it that we call the appetitive uh, portion of feeding. And the appetitive portion of feeding is the attractiveness of the food, where the food is, et cetera, et cetera. So we're getting visual inputs, we're getting olfactory inputs, and we're getting taste inputs, and then making some sort of a decision. Now, we're human beings. So one of the things that we can basically do is if we're going to um, ingest a particular uh, type of food, um, uh, 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 we can go and do that. And then if we made a very, very bad uh, judgment, uh, we can always retract what we're basically doing. By doing what? Emesis or vomiting. However, we have a rodent cousin, uh, mice and uh, rats. Mice and rats cannot vomit. They don't have an emetic reflex. So therefore, it becomes incredibly important to make various types of judgments about the food uh, in, uh, 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 as you have it in your mouth. And of course, the am amazing thing is that we have a whole subgroup of scientists who knew how to manipulate food, and they were basically called farmers. And uh, what farmers would basically do is try to get rid of vermin by poisoning them. And if they were small vermin, you would uh, poison a mouse or a rat. But if they were very large vermin, like uh, wolves that went after, or uh, coyotes that went after um, uh, uh, cattle or sheep or whatever, uh, you would basically poison a carcass. So the animal would uh, eat too much of it, couldn't vomit all the stuff back out and basically died. However, it's a very interesting thing uh, that, um, that basically you can, um, uh, you can uh, uh, learn something very quickly. And this is called a conditioned taste aversion. A very, very famous story. A guy by the name of John Garcia discovered this. And he was out at uh, California State University at San Bernardino. He basically discovered that if you um, pair a saccharin solution and an injection uh, some point after of lithium chloride into a uh, a, a, a rat's body, the lithium chloride will produce horrible, nauseous types of, um, uh, uh, of feelings, uh, uh, as, you know, sen uh, visceral feelings. And what does the animal base, what will the animal do? After one trial, those animals will stop, um, will no longer drink saccharin again. They'll, they will associate the sweet taste of saccharin with the aversive feeling of a lithium chloride uh, injection. And the way that you can eliminate that one trial condition taste aversion is by either destroying the nucleus tractus solitarius or destroying an area very close to the nucleus tractus solitarius called the area postrema. The area postrema is a circumventricular organ so that it basically is an area that is sort of on the border of what we hypothetically call the blood-brain barrier. 
and it has uh, a bit more permeability. So it can take in low levels of toxins and, and, and uh, basically uh, signal the brain that something like this is happening. So lesions of the area post tremor or lesions of the nucleus tractus solitarius will uh, create these, uh, 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 destroy these condition taste diversions. Why? Because what are you now doing with the nucleus tractus solitarius? You're integrating three different level, three different cranial nerve levels into a sensory experience. And what we basically see is that the nucleus tractus solitarius will eventually project up into the sensory thalamus, but it will also project into very important parts of the limbic system, like the amygdala. So an emotional aspect of feeding may play a role in here. So not only the dangerous things, but the also the other more positive uh, sensory or appetition aspects. So uh, here you basically can see uh, we have uh, taste buds uh, innovated by gustatory uh, neurons and that you come in and you're uh, going into the seventh cranial nerve, you're going into the ninth cranial nerve and you're getting inputs from the 10th cranial nerve. And you can see the nucleus of the solitary tract can ascend up into the BPL thalamus. And it will also go into places like the insula, but also go into uh, the hypothalamus and amygdala. Okay, so now let's look look at this uh, uh, slide for a second. And what we're basically find, we're seeing here is of course a wheel Weigert stain. And what we're basically seeing is up here is an area right around up here is the area post tremor, this area. Then what we see is the fourth ventricle. And what you can see right here is the uh, median eminence the intermediate eminence and the lateral eminence of the fourth ventricle. So what you can't see here, but you know it's sort of under there is the 12th cranial nerve, the sensory branch of the vagus, the motor branch of the vagus and the sensory branch of the vagus. And then what you can also see laterally is the larger and larger inferior cerebellar peduncle right here, which of course is containing the posterior spinocerebellar tract, cuneocerebellar tract, and the olivocerebellar tract. What you then also see is the MLF, because as you know, it's fibers coming out of the medial vestibular nucleus. And then what we see, sort of again, looking like a sardine or a fish here, is the very large medial lemniscus. And then we have the pyramids. And here we have the uh, uh, principal nucleus of the inferior olivary complex, the hyalus, the medial accessory, and the dorsal accessory nuclei. But the other things that you see here is sort of a la I, as you remember, I taught this course since 1979. So I got sort of excited when there was a movie back in the early 90s uh, uh, star, starring um, Anthony Hopkins as Hannibal Lecter. And I always remember the movie, they were searching for uh, a guy named Buffalo Bob, uh, 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 you know, who was a serial killer. And of course, Buffalo um, Bob, one of the things he absolutely, yes. It's one Buffalo of the things, Bill. Yeah, one of the things he absolutely loved was butterflies. So I always think of this particular slide because here it sort of looks like a pair of butterfly wings and not just the, a part of the brain. But what you see is this very interesting marking. 
there is the nucleus tractus solit there is the nucleus tractus solitarius the solitary tract is right here why because the medial portion of it is uh, uh, is uh, is the nucleus that is getting 10th cranial nerve innervation and the lateral portion is getting 7th and 9th cranial nerve innervation so there are the uh, there is uh, a mid medullary section so in a mid medullary slide also when we start to zoom away and we now look at the sort of dorsal surface of the fourth ventricle we're going to be basically seeing the vermis of the cerebellum so let's look at that for a second here is the vermis of the cerebellum. And we'll go through all of the nuclei of the cerebellar vermis a little later. And of course, we have the fourth ventricle with its eminences. Then the periventricular zone. So remember, in the central canal, we called it pericanular gray because peri around cannula uh, 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 around the central canal and gray uh, the cells. So the periventricular zone, we're gonna have two periventricular zones when we're talking, one that surrounds the fourth ventricle and one that surrounds the, the third ventricle. But right here, we're in the medulla and we have the uh, uh, hypoglossal motor vagus sensory vagus cranial nerves. So what you can again see is C is the C is the uh, fourth ventricle. We have the hypoglossal M. We have the uh, motor vagus uh, N. We have the uh, sensory vagus P. And then what you can see here is the tractus solitarius. So R is the tractus solitarius. Okay, then what we have are the major fibers that we've been looking at, the MLF, the medial lemniscus, and the corticospinal tract. So uh, U is the MLF. Notice how close it's getting to the periventricular surface. V and W is the medial lemniscus and K and Z is the corticospinal tract. Then what we have is uh, E is the uh, cerebellar peduncle, inferior cerebellar peduncle. So we see the inferior cerebellar peduncle, okay? And what you have, of course, in there is the posterior spinocerebellar, the cuneocerebellar, and the olivocerebellar. We then see X is the hilus, and then we see the principal nucleus, the medial accessory, and the dorsal accessory nuclei. Okay, so now we're now gonna move into the rostral medulla. And with the rostral medulla, we're gonna be noticing now the eighth cranial nerve inputs, then we're going to be noticing the seventh and ninth cranial nerve inputs and outputs. Why? Because they're mixed cranial nerves. Then we're going to be seeing the cerebellar vermis and the cerebellar dentate nuclei. So here is a diagram of this. So again, one of the things that I want to make sure that we go through is uh, what, what is here what's new and what left us. So we have now moved out of the middle medulla and now we're into the rostral medulla. So what don't we see anymore? <clears throat> we don't see the 12th cranial nerve, the 10th cranial nerve, the 11th, they're more caudal. What we are now seeing is the eighth cranial nerve and this is sort of asymmetrical so it can show it. And you can see the eighth cranial nerve which is known as the vestibular cochlear nerve. And what basically is happening 
is that the uh, cochlea branch of the vestibular cochlea nerve goes out a bit more dorsally uh, and laterally in the rostral medulla. And here it is synapsing into the dorsal cochlear nucleus. So here is the cochlear branch of the eighth cranial nerve synapsing into the dorsal cochlear nucleus. Here is the vestibular branch of the eighth cranial nerve, and it is sy synapsing. It is synapsing into the uh, medial and lateral vestibular nuclei. Now, the other part of the vent periventricular zone is that what we can see here is the ninth cranial nerve. You can see the motor part of the ninth cranial nerve and a sensory part of the uh, ninth cranial nerve. And then we can see the motor part of the seventh cranial nerve and the sensory part of the seventh cranial nerve. So what do we know is that the sensory parts of the seventh and ninth cranial nerves the axons of which will go into uh, the lateral portion of the uh, nucleus tractus solitarius. So that's what that's going to innovate. And what we basically also see in this asymmetrical thing is what we see here is still an inferior cerebellar peduncle. But what we see over here now is the emergence of the middle cerebellar peduncle. So here we have the medial vestibular nucleus. So very close to that is the MLF. We have the uh, medullary raphe nuclei that are very large. This is actually called the raphe magnus for its size. And then we have the, uh, we have what now looks like a pair of bowling pins is the MLF. And then we have the reticular formation. And now we have in a better way of how they were named, the dorsal accessory nucleus and the medial accessory nucleus of the inferior olivary complex, as well as the principal nucleus that really now looks like uh, a, a horseshoe. And then finally, we have the corticospinal tract. So the first thing that we're going to be basically covering in this, um, in this part is looking at the, uh, 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 some auditory and uh, vestibular input. So auditory information, of course, is operating in two different domains. In one domain, we're basically talking about amplitude uh, 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 and loudness. And then the other domain is we're talking about cycles per second of stimulation, uh, 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 otherwise known as Hertz, and then looking at things like pitch. So, what we know very quickly, I'll, you learned this back in Psych 101, we have the ear, the external ear canal that now hits the, uh, the eardrum. And the eardrum is uh, controlled by the tensor tympanic, uh, 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 is a tensor tympanic membrane. And this, this is basically controlled by the fifth cranial nerve, very strangely, as to whether you uh, tighten or loosen uh, the eardrum. And of course it's controlled by the set of bones of the anvil, stapes, and I'm blanking for a second, anvil uh, 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 and stapes. And we now then, what's that? I think it would be hammer or mallet. Thank you, thank you, see, all right. I had a senior moment there for a second. Okay. And of course, that then is connected to the uh, semicircular canals and we and the uh, cochlea. So the the cochlea. So what do we have? 
we have a very important thing in sensory perception, which is transduction. And there are two different types of transduction. That is um, sound is being carried through the air. But once we get into the middle and inner ear, we now have the, um, we now have the sound being transduced as waves, okay? Plus on top of this, we have semicircular canals that are going in three different types of directions that can give us input having to do with position. So now we move from uh, uh, air transduction of sound to liquid transduction of sound. And with liquid transduction of sound, we then have the liquid transduction of sound hitting uh, hair cells that now, now do mechanical movement. And the movement of the hair cells is now at, at the base going to activate uh, uh, sensory portions of nerves that form the uh, cochlea branch of the vestibular cochlea nerve, or in the case of semicircular canals, the vestibular branch of the vestibular cochlea nerve. And um, okay, so again, we have uh, the malleus, the incus, and the uh, things. I'm going to sort of skip this here. Uh, this is, uh, I hope you have picked this up in the past. And um, basically muscle contractions of these, uh, of these bones, uh, the muscles around the bones will cause the bones to be more rigid. And if you make it more rigid, you now uh, expand that um, or, or, or relax that tensor tympanic membrane, which dulls the sound, whereas a muscle relaxation will now allow uh, for the, uh, uh, the tympanic membrane to tighten uh, because um, the bones are relaxed and uh, 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 more, more and more uh, sharper sound can go through. So now we look at a cross section of the, of the uh, cochlea and we basically see um, uh, the uh, organs of corti and the basal membrane where uh, many, many of the uh, hair cells are. And in this area, you're bathed in a very calcium a rich environment that basically allows for a uh, neural conduction uh, to, uh, uh, to occur. And of course, what you have is uh, von Beckesche's um, place theory of frequency coded by place, basically taking uh, uh, an argument of pure, pure uh, a uh, place on the cochlea producing things or the amount of stimulation producing it. It's a combination. So there's properties of the membrane are gonna determine vibration and you have the uh, endolymph movement bends the basal membrane near the base and then the wave moves towards the apex. And the distance traveled depends on the sound frequency. So you're gonna have both the size of the sound and the frequency of the sound that determines what part of the basal membrane in the organs of corti are getting stimulated. So now what we have is we have uh, hair cells in the organs of corti that are transducing these mechanical energy into neural signals. And that uh, the hair cells, um, there's a particular auditory receptor that literally has about a hundred ste stereocilia cilia on top of the cell. And these things are basically formed into groups of eight. And the particular, uh, uh, the size of each stereocilia gets a little bit larger and larger and larger as you go along. So now, as sound, as uh, 
as a sound wave is moving through this liquid area, you basically have the shearing of the stereocilia. Now, if the stereocilia, if the sound is coming in this direction, what you're basically doing is bending the hair cell in this direction, which basically causes excitation. Now, what can basically happen is the sound can travel and come back again, and that can cause a movement of the stereocilia in an opposite direction. If it moves in an opposite direction, that is going to be inhibitory. So here we have, you can see the cilia and you can see them uh, organized uh, from shortest to longest. And you can basically see bending the cilia towards the kinocilium, the largest of the hair cells, uh, stretches the tip links and they mechanically open uh, potassium channels that results in excitation. So, it, so here is the way a sound as it's coming in, comes in. So it's hitting the shorter ones, the shorter ones. So it's like tipping things over and producing excitation. However, if that, if there is a sort of an echo chamber that moves and it comes and it comes back again, and you have the uh, kinocilium being uh, pushed, that will produce inhibition. Okay, so a uh, transduction by a hair cell is you have a potassium entering the cell, depolarizing it, it opens a voltage gated uh, 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 calcium channel, and you basically have the influx of calcium will end up with uh, the release of glutamate that will then activate that particular part of the spiral ganglion to, uh, of the vestibular cochlear nerve. So we have outer hair cells and inner hair cells. We have one inner hair cell uh, uh, that can uh, activate a whole bunch of spiral ganglia that then activate the auditory nerve. The outer hair cells uh, really uh, share a spiral ganglion cell. So it's the inner hair cells that are uh, producing the highest amount of auditory information. And of course, this thing is happening through the shearing force of the shearing. If you're shearing towards uh, the largest hair cell, you're getting excitation. If you're shearing away, you're getting inhibition. So basically what you can uh, see as when we saw with the somatosensory system and we had a somatotopic map, what you have Within the, uh, within the cochlea and the basal membrane is we have a tonotopic map. So the uh, part of the stapes end of the uh, of thing, you get a very sharp uh, type of thing. And then as you go out and out and out, you can notice that there is, um, uh, uh, you need a much greater amount of excitation. Okay, so, uh, and this tono, just like the somatotopic organization is maintained uh, in the dorsal column as it gets to the nucleus gracilis and nucleus cuneatus, it does so somatotopically. And then as you go to the medial lemniscus and you hit the VPL thalamus, again, it's somatotopically. And then when you go from the BPL thalamus through the posterior limb of the internal capsule to the somatosensory cortex, you do that somatotopically. Same thing here. The, uh, the uh, apex of, uh, uh, here's the apex in the base of the cochlea, uh, very, uh, the short places right here, you're getting a characteristic uh, 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 frequency that goes up into 
uh, the uh, into the cochlear nucleus, and they are uh, tonotopically organized, and that tonotopic organization stays throughout all the relay nuclei, of which there are many, then to the medial geniculate body, and then to the auditory cortex in the superior temporal gyrus. So here is our friend, the auditory system. Here you see the uh, cochlear nerve coming in and synapsing in the dorsal cochlear nucleus. Now, what you can see here is the dorsal cochlear nucleus can now communicate with the medial geniculate body way up here in any number of ways. Number one, it can shoot up ipsilateral projections through the lateral lemniscus. So what do we just learn here? The medial lemniscus is a major pa sensory pathway that is carrying somatosensory information. In fact, at the level of the mid-medulla, it is not only carrying dorsal column and dorsal column postsynaptic information, it is also carrying anterior spinothalamic information. The lateral lemniscus is carrying auditory information. This first pathway out of the dorsal cochlear nucleus gives what? Ipsilateral information to the lateral lemniscus. Then a second pathway will basically go and form the uh, uh, synapse on the superior olivary nucleus. So if you remember, the inferior olivary nucleus is involved in what? Cerebellar modulation, whereas the superior olivary nucleus is involved in auditory information. The superior olivary nucleus, the axons, of the superior olivary nucleus, come on, will we'll decussate and go up through the contralateral lateral lemniscus. Then what we have are other sets of dorsal cochlear fibers that now synapse on the nucleus of the tra trapezoid body or they just cross immediately and go into the lateral lemniscus. So the lateral lemniscus, as we're leaving, has dorsal cochlear fibers in it, okay? But they can be ipsilateral dorsal cochlear fibers, contralateral dorsal cochlear fibers, and then the axons of the superior olivary complex and the axons of the nucleus of the trapezoid body. All of those are contralateral. So one of the things that you can learn uh, or, uh, in cognitive neuroscience is uh, a way of studying the brain is something called auditory event related potentials or ERPs. A person who studies that on our faculty is Skip Johnson. So if you wanna know anything about auditory event related potentials, look at Skip Johnson's website and whatever. And usually when we're studying cognitive neuroscience, we're studying activation up in the cortex. And what we get or the, when we have an auditory event-related potential, there is a very interesting cognitive um, uh, thing called the P300. It's, it occurs roughly 300 milliseconds after the auditory uh, potential happens. And this, this P300 wave that happens all around our cortex 
is a very good predictor of cognitive performances, okay? However, when we are looking at the, uh, an auditory event related potential, we not only see P300s, we see N200, and then we actually see uh, events happening uh, all the way back, at, all the way down at about 50 milliseconds. What are those events? Those are the events of the dorsal cochlear nerve, of the superior olivary nucleus, and of the nucleus of the trapezoid body getting activated and acti activating the lateral lemnisci. So now the lateral lemniscus will travel through the med uh, rostral medulla, into the pons, into the midbrain, and a, it appears laterally in the midbrain, and we'll see it, and it will eventually go into the inferior colliculus, where they synapse. So what is synapsing in the uh, inferior colliculus? What's synapsing in the inferior colliculus is, um, is the, uh, uh, are both ipsilateral fibers coming out of the dorsal cochlea and contralateral fibers that are either directly from the dorsal cochlea or from the superior olivary or trapezoid nuclei. So if we are at the inferior colliculus, it now goes into uh, a joke. And what I have to do is I have to correct my joke uh, right now. So I am not, um, I am not uh, uh, insensitive. What we're basically gonna call uh, a scientist is a famous, famous scientist uh, looking at cause and effect, okay? So what he's doing is he's studying a frog and uh, he basically screams at the frog, jump frog, jump, and the frog jumps. Then uh, he cuts off one leg of the frog. He goes, jump frog, jump, and the frog doesn't jump as high. Cuts off two legs, that jumps less. Three legs, jumps less. Four legs, he now has a legless frog in front of him. And he goes, jump, frog, jump, jump, frog, jump, jump, frog, jump. And the frog doesn't jump. And the scientist writes down, severing four limbs confers deafness on the frog. Okay. <laughs> and of course, where does the frog's auditory system end? In the inferior colliculus. And, and of course, you can figure out you can go through the philosophy of science as to why, what he did wrong. Okay, so anyway, uh, from the inferior colliculus, you then have the fibers go up in tonotopic fashion to the medial geniculate body. And then in the, uh, the medial geniculate body of the, of the thalamus sends out its fibers into the temporal radiations, and we go up into the superior temporal cortex. And that is the uh, basic auditory system. So you can basically see, and in these uh, particular slides, you start to basically get a, uh, some ideas as to what the superior olivary nuclei are doing, what the trapezoid nuclei are doing, et cetera, in terms of sound. So um, the acoustic or temporal radiations, you can see right here, leaving the medial geniculate body, going up to the auditory cortex in this sort of tonotopic array. Now the vestibular nuclei, as I pointed out, uh, comes in and it will innovate the medial vestibular nucleus and the lateral vestibular nucleus. Okay, so there we go, a very quick uh, 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 Cook's tour of the, uh, of the, um, 
of the auditory system. Okay, it's 1050. Um, I'm basically, uh, okay, or uh, tracks is good. Everybody sort of, and that poor frog, that poor frog, yes. Okay, anyway, uh, at this point, I'm going to refill my coffee cup. You guys can take a little two minute break and we'll come back. Okay. My pointer doesn't want to move much. Whoops. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna be basically looking at the arostral medullary slide. And what we can see here is uh, B is the fourth ventricle. C is the vestibular nuclei. O we can see is the MLF. D is the dorsal cochlear nucleus. Q is the ventral cochlear nucleus and uh, superior olivary area. E is the inferior cerebellar peduncle. And of course, we still have the medial lemniscus N, the inferior olivary complex and the corticospinal tract. So that's the end of our medulla. Okay. So now,
Okay, so now we're gonna go to Why don't I have it here? Doggone it. Whoops. Why don't I see my thing here? Give me a second, I'm sorry. Ah, finally. I apologize for the glitch there. There we go. So now we're entering the ponds. Okay. So as we enter the ponds and leave the medulla, one of the first things that we're now entering into is basically starting to deal with another set of cranial nerves, which of course is the uh, seventh cranial nerve, and then uh, the facial senses, the fifth cranial nerve, and then we're gonna then have uh, facial senses and muscles, and then the eye muscles. So here's a nice diagram for the fifth and for the seventh with both the uh, descending root of the fifth and uh, uh, the, uh, the seventh cranial nerves. So when we start to deal with the seventh cranial nerve, we're dealing uh, uh, in, in a lot of ways with the anterior one third of the tongue. And we are starting to pay attention to uh, taste perception. And of course, what we're looking at is uh, five different taste categories that have been definitively uh, defined. And we basically see saltiness, of course, a reaction to sodium, sourness, which has a reaction to various types of dilute acids, uh, hydrogen, uh, sweetness, uh, sugars, some proteins, and then artificial sweeteners. And then bitterness, which is our uh, taste reactivity to ions like potassium and magnesium and uh, various types of molecules like quinine, uh, caffeine, and many poisons. And then uh, later in the uh, thing, we basically came up with umami taste, which is a chemical sensitivity to amino acid glutamate. 
and the whole aspect of savory. There is a six taste category, but the exact receptors and the mechanisms are not known. There's a greater and greater amount of, uh, of uh, evidence that argues that there are taste receptors for fat. Whereas before, when people basically try to describe fat in terms of, uh, they didn't describe it in terms of taste, they described it in terms of texture and that the uh, fat uh, texture on the tongue stimulated seventh cranial nerve inputs that would tell us that we're ingesting fat. So uh, obviously these tastes uh, allow us to uh, identify nutritional needs like salt, sugar, and protein, and then, uh, uh, and then certain types of avoidance, which is sourness, which usually comes in ran rancid food, or bitterness, which comes in toxins. So the tongue is sensitive to all tastes. Uh, everywhere there are taste receptors. There are taste receptors around the uh, around the tongue, on the soft palate at the back roof of the mouth, on the epiglottis. There are areas that have heavier sensitivities. So the tip of the tongue is very, uh, it, it seems more sensitive to sweet. And the back of the tongue is uh, bitterness, uh, uh, more sensitive to bitterness. And the sides of the tongue is sensitive to salt, saltiness and sourness. However, uh, uh, what used to be uh, sort of taste maps seems to be wrong, that the, there are all of these receptors in all of these different areas. In fact, there's taste receptors in the gut. So uh, all of these things uh, uh, can happen, but they happen in uh, differing amounts. So uh, as we pointed out, this old map of, of just saying, this is where uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the receptors are, uh, are and are only there is uh, somewhat wrong. There is higher amounts of sweet receptors in the tongue, salty and sour on the sides, bitter in the back, but you can find all of the tastes uh, all the way throughout. Okay, so saltiness is uh, the taste transduction of a, uh, a salty taste cell is basically working through a sodium ion channel, salt sensitive taste cells. And they are different from voltage gated sodium channels in that they are always open and they're they insensitive to voltage. So, not all uh, sodium tastes the same. Large ions inhibit taste of, uh, of, um, of uh, sodium. So acetate is less salty than sodium chloride. All of the mechanisms that uh, I am talking about here, all I'm doing is identifying them. Uh, as in many of these cases, I sort of turn uh, 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 the, the baton over uh, to your course in molecular neuroscience, which is taught by Jeff Beeler, who will go in much more detail about the physiology. I'm just quickly identifying this. So sourness is an ion channel, um, uh, uh, ion channel and uh, uh, protons, H plus, are the causative agents of acidity, and it passes through an amelioride sodium channel. And what happens here is they bind and block calcium channels, and they prevent calcium from leaving the cell, and thereby uh, 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 depolarize the cell by not letting the, the potassium out. The same, uh, there's the same pathway for bitter, sweet, and umami, except what you have are different receptors. So what you're basically going to have, first of all, 
is the inositol uh, triphosphate pathway, the IP3 pathway, that the tastent activates a GP, G protein coupled taste receptor. The G proteins then activate phospholipase C, which is second messenger. Phospholipase C increases inositol triphosphate. Then inositol triphosphate activates the sodium ion channel. Sodium enters the cell, the cell depolarizes, and then the voltage-gated calcium channels open. So uh, with the sweet tastings uh, are, uh, are, are, uh, are uh, picked up by uh, the same um, by the same receptor. However, some uh, a nutritive um, a sweet sweetener like sucrose, but not sucro, uh, but not sucralose can activate dopamine uh, brain areas, but it doesn't happen at the level of the taste receptor. It is happening further downstream in the brain. Sweet perception also engages a second pathway, which is cyclic AMP. So you have the taste and activating a G protein coupled taste receptor that then uh, activates adenyl cyclase. Then adenyl cyclase activates cyclic AMP and that activates protein kinase A and it closes calcium channels by phosphorylation. So now the calcium doesn't escape and the cell can have a higher degree of depolarizing. So bitter, uh, unlike uh, the, unlike the, um, uh, unlike sweet, uh, uh, quinine likely blocks uh, calcium channels uh, and causes depolarization. And there are G protein coupled bitter receptors, one that it works through phospholipase C by increasing inositol triphosphate, and then a G protein gustucin that activates uh, phosphodiesterase and decreases cyclic AMP. Okay, so that's just a very quick uh, look through with the taste receptors. And again, what you basically see is a somewhat coded system. Okay, so now we are, uh, as we move from the medulla into the pons and eventually into the midbrain, we now have to consider uh, eye muscles because what we know is that the medullary uh, pontine border, we have the sixth cranial nerve, which is uh, uh, the abductions. And then in the caudal midbrain, we're gonna have the trochlear nerve, and then we are then going to have the third cranial nerve, the oculomotor, as well as the oculomotor complex. So the whole thing about the uh, about uh, uh, eye muscles is we pay attention to uh, six, dif seven different crane, uh, seven different muscles. One is the medial erectus muscle, which is located right here and is going to pull, uh, 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 pull the eye uh, uh, medially. The lateral rectus muscle, which pulls the eye laterally. The superior rectus muscle, which pulls the eye dorsally. The inferior rectus muscle that pulls the eye inferiorly. Then we have the superior oblique, which pulls the eye dorsolaterally and the inferior oblique that pulls the eye uh, ventromedially. And then of course, we have a seventh muscle and that muscle is sitting right in the middle of the eyeball and it happens to be pigmented. And that of course is the iris muscle, which is again going to control the um, control the size of the pupil. So 
Here are the list of the uh, different cranial nerves, and then how each of these cranial nerves are controlling um, uh, uh, particular eye muscles. The sixth cranial nerve, the abductions, is, uh, is the, uh, controls the lateral rectus muscle. So with the lateral rectus muscle is when it is taut, it is pulling the eyes outward, okay? Uh, obviously more than one muscle is working at any given time, but that's the typical uh, thing that it's doing. So the interesting thing is asking what would happen if all of a sudden we had bilateral destruction of the sixth cranial nerve. If you had bilateral destruction of the sixth cranial nerve, you no longer have the motor control of the lateral rectus muscle. So therefore, the lateral rectus muscle literally becomes flaccid. So what, what type of situation can you have with bilateral destruction of the abduction's nerve? What you have is a person who is called cross-eyed, okay? The eyes are getting pulled medially because there is no lateral contra, uh, contratomp, okay? So the point of the matter is, how often do you ever have bilateral destruction of the abductions? You don't, but under certain circumstances, you can have some dysfunction of the abductions nerve in which now uh, what you may have, and you may have it in a unilateral kind of way, so what you may end up with is something that my mother would talk about because she suffered from it in a certain way, which is basically called lazy eye, the eye or in the stagnus, where uh, the eye is not rapidly um, uh, focusing. So therefore, when you have a difficulty in which you have eye movements and the eye movements and the signals are coming in bilaterally. What you want are what are called conjugate eye movements. You want the two eyes to literally move at the same direction, at the same speed, at the same time. So anything like uh, nystagmus or a problem with the lateral rectus, all of a sudden uh, one eye is no longer moving. So now that of course brings us to a very, very important type of, uh, of, uh, of finding. And that of course was the work of Hubel and Weasel who basically found that what you have is the uh, neurophysiological representation of whatever is hitting the two eyes are coming back into the primary occipital cortex and that they identified different types of cells, simple cells and complex cells. They did talk about hypercomplex cells, but then dropped that in which um, simple cells are giving you information about uh, the uh, positioning of an edge. And whereas complex cells are giving you information about the length of such an edge. And that what we know because of the innovation of the retina and the partial decussation, and the fact that you go back to the um, lateral geniculate body that has layers coming in from each eye. And they then feed via Myers loop and the occipital, uh, 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 the occipital radiations that you have input uh, of both eyes in, uh, on either side of the occipital lobe. And of course, they then did a classic experiment in which kittens at different ages were outfitted with a, um, a, a contact lens 
which made the eye completely opaque, didn't get any kind of light. And they put uh, this contact lens on the kitten at different ages. If they put it in right after birth and then waited about six or seven weeks and then removed the contact lens and now stimulated either, uh, either eye, what basically would happen is that the neurophysiological responses of the occipital cortex to light of the unimpeded eye was actually magnified. That is, you could get, you could get uh, uh, this uh, stimulation over a larger portion of the occipital cortex. Whereas if you now stimulated the uh, occluded eye, you got virtually no responses because what they basically talked about here is a, a, a neurophysiologically aligned columnar organization so that um, uh, uh, you needed a, 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 a light stimuli to come into both of the eyes for the proper formation of the columnar organization of the occipital cortex into left, right, left, right, left, right. Very importantly, if you took a kitten that was like something like three months old and occluded its eye for three months and then took it, uh, took off the contact lens, what you basically still saw is this left right organization. That, so what did that basically tell you? That basically told you that this, um, that this uh, 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 occipital organization was due to um, uh, some type of critical period that early in cortical development, postnatal development, you needed the full connection of these uh, 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 of this uh, of this uh, information. So um, when we now look at these eye muscles, and we see that all of a sudden there are eye muscles that are working perfectly all of them, or they're not working perfectly and you end up with this nystagmus or lazy eye, basically what is going to happen is that the, uh, that the brain will basically determine that and literally shut off particular types of information that is coming in from the so-called uh, nystagmus related eye. So the sixth cranial nerve is controlling the lateral rectus. The fourth cranial nerve is controlling the superior oblique. The third cranial nerve is part of a complex. There is the oculomotor nerve and there is the edinger westfall nuclei. We're going to see them pretty soon. The oculomotor nerve, of course, is controlling uh, uh, five different muscles. It's controlling the medial rectus, the superior rectus, the inferior rectus, the inferior oblique. And then it controls a muscle that has virtually nothing to do with vision, but can influence vision. And that is the eyelid. And of course, we have uh, one of my favorite words in Greek, not that I know many Greek words, is ptosis, P-T-O-S-I-S, -S, which is what? A droopy eyelid. So that a person with damage to uh, a oculomotor nerve where it does not control the eyelid to open it, Obviously, this is going to affect this person's vision. Now, within the third cranial nerve complex, you're going to have the oculomotor nerve in the ventrolateral portion, left and right. And then you're going to have this edinger westfall nuclei. And where the edinger westfall nuclei in the midbrain is going to be getting um, enormous amounts of input from the 
posterior portion of the superior and middle frontal gyri, which is basically called the frontal eye fields. It is an area of the cortex, just rostral to the precentral gyrus, but on the other side of the precentral sulcus, that goes down and literally controls the angiospinal nucleus. So what it's doing is getting lots of uh, information coming in from the tertiary uh, visual cortex up into this frontal eye fields. The frontal eye fields go down into the angiospinal nucleus. And uh, I always remember when I took my first physiological psychology course with a guy who eventually became my mentor up at City College, a guy by the name of Saul Steiner. He always loved uh, particular, um, particular little uh, 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 like uh, sentences that just concisely describe things. And one of the sentences was, the CNS controls its own inputs. And here, the Edinger-Westfall nucleus is an excellent example of that. So what are we saying? The CS CNS not only is just the passive uh, conveyor of input, but it can modulate the amount of input it takes in. And you don't get it any better than the Edinger-Westfall nucleus and the iris. So the iris is a circular muscle. Okay, so when a, the, the muscle constricts, basically it is pulling itself outwardly. So any space that the muscle does not occupy is now opened. And of course, there is a space that uh, the iris surrounds. That space is called the pupil, which is literally a hole. So now, with iris constriction, if the edinger westfall nucleus tells the iris to constrict, what you're basically doing is you are uh, shrinking the total size of the iris, but concomitantly, you are increasing the opening of the pupil, hence pupillary dilation, hence more light enters the iris. And then uh, conversely, you can have a signal in which the, uh, you basically tell um, the iris to relax, okay? In which case the muscle now takes, that circular muscle now takes up more space, shrinking the size of the hole in the middle, the pupil. So now we have pupillary constriction and less light. So, two wonderful examples of the CNS modulating its own input has been with the Edinger-Westfall nucleus control of the iris. And then earlier today, we basically talked about the fifth cranial nerves control of the tensor tympanic membrane that either tightens the eardrum for greater sound transduction or relaxes the eardrum for more muffled uh, sound transduction. And of course, the best example of that is with the sound, all of a sudden you're in a subway station or we're not in many subway stations anymore. And you hear, uh, uh, if you're at 42nd Street and uh, uh, the trains are coming around the turn, the decibel level goes ways up and you don't have to put your, uh, you can do two things. You can put your, hand over your ears, but what you can also do is you can have your cranial nerve relax the tensor tympanic membrane. Or if you're in a movie theater for a long time, and we're not in that much anymore either, and then you go walking outside, all of a sudden the exit, walk into daylight, all of a sudden the uh, 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 iris will relax and there'll be less light coming into the pupil. In both cases, you're modulating your own inputs. Okay, another area around the ponds, of course, 
is the trigeminal inputs and outputs. And what we can see is trigeminal nerves name that because it has three different branches. The upper and more superior branch is the ophthalmic branch in which you uh, are, uh, have innervation of the upper face and the eye area. Then you have the maxillary branch, which is uh, uh, controlling the upper jaw, the lips and the cheek and the upper oral cavity. And then the lower jaw of the mandibular branch is controlling the lower face. So what you can basically see is that the ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular uh, divisions uh, get sensory input. They come in along the ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular uh, nerves and enter into the trigeminal ganglion. And then the trigeminal ganglion will then uh, have a main sensory nucleus that is in the um, that is in the uh, uh, fifth cranial nerve. So you see the fifth cranial nerve over here has both uh, the, uh, the sensory portion of it is more rostral than the main, uh, sensor, uh, main nucleus sensory. And then the spinal nucleus is far more, uh, more motor as a mixed cranial nerve. So now, what we have followed is the, um, is the uh, dorsal column system, where we have looked at the fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus synapse seen on the nucleus gracilis and nucleus cuneatus that then gives rise to the internal arcuate fibers decussating the medial lemniscus going up to the VPL thalamus. So what we basically have now uh, uh, done is talk about somatosensory inputs that are coming from where? They're coming from the neck all the way down uh, to the legs and uh, sacral innervation. But head innervation, some of it, of course, is coming through uh, the seventh cranial nerve, although that's much more taste, but it's the trigeminal pathway with the ophthalmic, uh, maxillary, and mandibular branches taking in all of the sensory information of the face, and it comes in in the middle of, uh, middle of the pons and in the caudal midbrain. And basically the second order fibers of the sensory part of the trigeminal now basically forms the trigeminothalamic tract that literally follows and is in somatotopic organization with the medial lemniscus. So what we know is what? Whereas the medial lemniscus synapses in the VPL thalamus, the trigeminothalamic tract synapses in the VPM thalamus. So then, so that is uh, for, for, uh, uh, for, um, and for both pathways, remember um, the nucleus gracilis and nucleus cuneatus gave rise to the medial lemniscus that syn synapses in the VPL. The tri sensory trigeminal are synapsing in the VPM via the trigeminal thalamic. Then the, then the second order axons of the VPL and VPM then form the posterior uh, limb uh, 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 of the internal capsule, and it goes up to the post-central gyrus. So one thing that can basically happen here is when we're basically looking, especially at the trigeminal ganglion, that confluence of the ophthalmic mandibular and uh, uh, maxillary and mandibular uh, branches, what you basically have is an area here that is heavy, heavily, heavily vascularized. And in some cases, you will basically have blood vessels that literally encircle the trigeminal nerve. 
And then small changes in blood pressure can then produce vascular compression upon the trigeminal nerve root. And when you have that compression, you literally can then experience pain and other neuralgic symptoms, symptoms of some type of sensory awareness, even though there's no sensory stimulus. And in trigeminal neuralgia, which is a very, very debilitating type of uh, disease, a lot of times uh, this can be ameliorated by either various types of blood pressure medications or literal surgery that basically moves the um, uh, 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 refocus, uh, refocuses the uh, blood vessels. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're now going to look at a ponto medullary section. Let me just stop the share for a second. And okay, I, I'm just looking at how much time I have. I think we're in pretty good shape here. Okay. Okay, so we're going to be looking at the eighth cranial nerve, the seventh cranial nerve, the sixth cranial nerve, and the medial longitudinal fasciculus, the uh, uh, medial lemniscus, and the corticospinal tract. And we're looking at this because, again, we're asking this very simple question when we look at this ponto uh, medullary area. What is still there? What is no longer there? What has changed? And what is new? So in this ponto medullary area, we can see some dramatic, dramatic changes. Versus a mid-medullary section, what did we see on the inferior surface of the brain? What we saw was the um, pyramids, the corticospinal tract. But now as we look rostrally, do we still have a corticospinal tract? And the answer is yes, but it is now embedded within the inferior surface of the brain. It is coursing caudally, but what has, what has uh, taken it over? And we saw this on our very first day of classes when we looked at the inferior surface of the brain and we looked at an area that we call the pons. What we basically saw was the middle cerebellar peduncle, right? The middle cerebellar peduncle of brachium pontus. What basically is happening in this pontomedullary section is that we have the uh, brachium pontus and it is decussating, okay? And of course, what we're now gonna form in here is another area called the grisium pontus, which is a group of, uh, of cells, an enormous number of cells in this uh, area that get synapses and then forms further the middle cerebellar peduncle. What other thing is missing? Well, if we notice from the caudal medulla going forward, what we basically saw is this rather distinctive structure called the principal nucleus and the dorsal and medial accessory nuclei of the inferior olivary complex. Notice in the very rostral medulla and in the pons, there is no longer the inferior olivary complex. Third, we do have a medial lemniscus, but what was happening to the medial lemniscus in the medulla? What we saw in the very caudal medulla is that it was vertically oriented and it was literally right next to each other because of the decussating internal arcuate fibers. 
But then as we moved rostrally through the medulla, it kept its uh, horizontal orientation, uh, uh, vertical orientation, but it started moving more laterally. Now, as we get into the rostral medulla and pons, we see now that the medial lemniscus is what? Horizontally aligned. It is now horizontally aligned. Why? What's basically going to happen? And again, it is horizontally aligned and it is somatotopically organized so that eventually it's going to move out more and more laterally as we ascend until it gets into the BPL thalamus. And of course, what's going to join it a little bit further up is going to be the, um, the uh, trigeminal thalamic tract. Now, what we can do is we can use we can use the um, the medial lemniscus as a border, this horizontally aligned border. What we have dorsal or superior to the medial lemniscus is the reticular formation. What we have ventral to the medial lemniscus is the Grisium pontus. The Grisium pontus is again, billions of cells literally connecting and, and communicating with the middle cerebellar peduncle, okay? The reticular formation that we saw as far caudal as the uh, caudal medulla, and we're gonna see it as far rostral as the entire midbrain, uh, are a group of other cells that really do not have to do with the cerebellum. Grisium pontus has to do with cerebellar function. The uh, uh, reticular formation has to do with integration of information uh, having to do with the spinal cord below it and the upper brain above it. And there were, I basically say that the years 1947 to 1949 were incredible years, formative years in the eventual development of neuroscience. Because in that time, there were a series of studies done in the reticular formation in which, um, uh, 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 in which they were anatomically identified some of the cells and some underlying physiological function came out of it. And that, the, so the underlying physiological uh, uh, ideas came out of the work of uh, Maruzzi and Magoon, M-O-R-U-Z-Z-I and M-A-G-O-U-N. And they worked at UCLA. Basically, uh, they, uh, they take an animal, which is what I basically consider, and by the way, I sit there with three of them all day up here and everything. And when I'm not lecturing or doing other things, very often I can go and I can sit and watch them. And those are my cats. Now I've, I've had seven dogs through my uh, career. Unfortunately, my last two died a, uh, a year ago and then uh, three years ago and I missed them very much. But I have my three cats. And when I watch my three cats, what you watch is the most wonderful example of different levels of consciousness that you can ever come across. I think a cat is magnificent in demonstrating different levels of consciousness from uh, being totally asleep, maybe being and watching REM sleep with a cat is just wonderful. And then basically looking at a cat where it's awake, but you know, its eyes are closed and it looks like it's in some form of Zen meditation, then you have uh, things and then you basically move up the consciousness scale 
to some sort of orienting and alerting and then arousal and whatever. And Marutzi and Magoon basically studied the reticular activating system, and they called it that, the ascending reticular activating system, ARAS, ascending because it's going up, up towards the brain, the diencephalon and the telencephalon, uh, reticular because it was net-like, activating because it's a sort of uh, an ensemble as you're sort of building and building with the number of neurons basically firing and a system that's working in an integrated way to basically increase levels of consciousness. And basically large lesions of the ascending reticular activating system versus the ventrolateral medulla will have an animal that is literally comatose. And of course you take that work of Maruzzi and Magoon in the late forties and then pair it with the earlier work of the Swiss neurophysiologist uh, uh, Bremer. Uh, and you basically have a really wonderful picture of the idea of, uh, of consciousness because what Bremer basically did again in a cat is do the cerveau uh, en safale, which would be a cut of the spinal cord between the, uh, 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 the upper spinal cord in which you sever the upper spinal cord from the brain. And of course, his very simple question was, uh, it, is the brain dependent on sensory input? And of course, what he basically found is that the whole electrophysiological activation of the brain as you move from sleeping and waking and everything was not dependent on sensory input. But then what he also did was he did the, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the, the servo isole rather than ensemble, in which he made a cut, uh, cutting the midbrain away from the brain. And basically here, he basically produced a comatose animal because what were you basically doing? You were separating that ascending uh, 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 reticular activating system from upper parts of the brain and not allowing that activation. Then basically you could do a further cut, which would be mid pontine in which you could then start to separate out slow wave sleep from, uh, from REM sleep, which of course was discovered three years later by Azarinsky and Kleitman uh, in 1953. The anatomical aspects of this reticular activating system is basically shown by what a, neuron, a, a subset of neurons within the reticular activating system that are just clear by their size. And hence they are given the very, very clear literal term NRGC neurons, nucleus reticularis gigantocellularis. These are very large neurons. A whole subset of them are cholinergic neurons. And what basically happens is they're big and they have large dendritic areas, and then they send out an axon, and then that axon bifurcates, and the axon goes all the way down into the spinal cord, and then the axon goes all the way up into the thalamus and limbic system, and even up into the basal ganglia. And they're almost thought of as um, uh, 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 NRGC neurons as, as um, alarm clock neurons. And again, tie very, very much into the whole idea of the reticular activating system and, and, um, and uh, consciousness. So now let's look at what we uh, basically see here. 
what we can see is the eighth cranial nerve right out here going into the cochlear branch and the vestibular branch. We have the seventh cranial nerve. The sensory branch of the seventh cranial nerve is right here. And then the motor branch of the seventh cranial nerve is here. So now if you remember, I said, when we're in the medulla, we can identify two donuts. And uh, the first donut I pointed out that when you have especially a wheel Weigert stain, you basically see the whole of the donut as the tract of solitary tract and the, uh, the outer part of the donut is the cell bodies of the, of the solitary nucleus that's innervated by the sev uh, seventh, ninth and 10th cranial nerves. So uh, when you look at that donut on a wheel Weigert stain, what are you basically gonna see? You're gonna see a black hole surrounded by a, uh, 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 an unstained nucleus. Here, we have a very interesting trip. Here is the seventh cranial nerve, the motor nucleus of the seventh cranial nerve. Rather than exiting the brain laterally, for some totally strange reason, this cranial nerve circles around and circumnavigates the sixth cranial nerve and then shoots outward. So when we have the motor seventh, the motor seventh is leaving the nucleus and then it forms a genu, G-E-N-U, a sort of a knee-shaped thing going around the sixth and then forming the seventh. So if we were looking at a wheel Weigert stain here and we see a donut, the, the uh, body of the donut would be dark and the center of the donut, which is the sixth cranial nerve would be unstained. So you see the seventh cranial nerve sensory and a seventh cranial nerve motor. And then you see the sixth cranial nerve, the abductions nerve. And we identified that earlier as what? A motor nerve. And we see that it exits the brain medially. And of course, as we just learned, the sixth cranial nerve is innervating the lateral rectus muscle. So, and then we still have the, uh, uh, the raphe nuclei and we have the MLF. So notice how close the MLF is to the sixth cranial nerve. Okay, so now we're gonna look a little bit further, uh, uh, another pontomedullary section in which we are actually looking at structures. And here I have the, uh, the definitions. So here we have the vermis of the cerebellum, the deep cerebellar nuclei, which we'll talk about later. We then have the superior, uh, excuse me for a second. Yep, we have the superior cerebellar peduncle right here, because what does that superior cerebellar peduncle although it's in the midbrain and there's a lot of fibers coming out of the cerebellum that are ascending, but then there are descending fibers, including our friend, the anterior spinocerebellar tract that goes all the way up to the midbrain, decussates again, and then shoots down to form the superior cerebellar peduncle of brachium conjunctivum. Then we have the uh, medial longitudinal fasciculus, E. Then we have the reticular formation, Q, all along here. Then we have the medial lemniscus, J, K, L, M, N, G. 
Then we have the Grisium Pontus S. Now we have the corticospinal tract. Sorry about that. We have the corticospinal tract buried within the middle cerebellar peduncle R. Okay, and now we'll look at yet another section that sort of now starts to show what the brainstem looks like in terms of a much, much larger uh, type of, uh, of brain. So you see the deep cerebellar nuclei right here. You see the middle cerebellar peduncle of brachium pontus coming down. You see the corticospinal tract here. You then see the large grisium pontus here. You see the medial limniscus marked by the letter N here. And then what we have in this pontine section are some other periventricular nuclei, which are very, very hard to see, but are uh, quite important uh, anatomically. At the letter E right here, we have the, what is called the dorsal tegmental nucleus. And the dorsal tegmental nucleus is a periventricular nucleus. And we're gonna connect the periventricular nucleus, the dorsal tegmental nucleus, a periventricular nucleus in the pons with um, the pericanular nuclei where, uh, where we have sympathetic arousal with the periaqueductal gray nuclei that we'll talk about soon and then the periventricular nuclei that surround the third ventricle. And what we basically see in here is an enormous number of, 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 um, uh, of homeostatic functions that are controlled simply because when you think of the ventricular system being what? A sort of surround of that basic uh, beginning of the neural tube. Now, we have a rather small and inconspicuous type of nucleus here called the locus cerealis. Let me see where I am here. Yeah, okay. We're uh, pretty much at the end here. So let me just, let me just, uh, talk for a uh, last few minutes with F, the locus cerealis. Uh, the locus cerealis is sort of a nucleus uh, that comes like out of the uh, book, the little engine that could. If you ever looked at that as a child book, you know, it's a little, in, little locomotive who said, I can go and pull the big train and just look it up if you've never if you've never had it read to, or if you have children, go and read the, uh, that, that book. So it's this little nucleus. It's literally in the human being, it's about 3000 cells on either side, but it is unique in the brain. Why? Because every cytoarchitecturally identified cell of the locus cerealis Every last one of those cells synthesizes and releases the neurotransmitter norepinephrine. It is the only nucleus in the brain that has a total, similar, identical um, uh, neurochemical signature. And what we're basically going to see is that this nucleus, sort of like its friend, the NRGC in the, uh, in the medulla, where it reaches in and out different subcellular parts of the locus cerealis will go up 
and innervate the cerebellum. It will go down and will innervate the dorsal horn. And like with serotonin, when it's activated and, and, and uh, acts on the dorsal horn, will inhibit pain. It will, it will go into the pericanula gray and activate symp sympathetic activation. It will, it will <coughs> go in the ventral horn and inhibit alpha and gamma motor neurons. It will then activate and act on cells, other cells in the neighboring medulla and pons. It will release and act and act on major dopaminergic neurons in the midbrain. It will go and reach and innervate all four cortical lobes, the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, and the occipital lobe. And it will selectively innervate the hippocampus so as to produce with that activation, something called hippocampal theta, which basically is tied very often into things having to do with the consolidations of short-term memory. So what we're going to basically do at the beginning of the next class is take on the locus cerealis and look at noradrenergic innovation of the brain as we keep moving through the brain here. So we are, uh, I know we again covered a large amount of material, but what you're basically starting to get a sense of, and this is the way you should attack when you're looking at the brain. Look at each of the sections. Always say when you see a section, what came before it, what's coming after it. So what's the same? What's different? And did things change position? So you have a really beginning idea of how the brain is organized. Then I then go into the thing of just because you have something, sometimes adjacency is incredibly important. That is two structures next to each other or next to each other because they do complementary things or opposite things or whatever, and you can understand that. But sometimes you have two structures that are next to each other and they have absolutely nothing to do with one another. And what becomes important there is that when you're now basically looking at brain damage and you start to look at that, you can now start to, uh, and you have damage that goes beyond a particular nucleus you can be looking at the symptom at hand that you're studying, but you can also look at other kinds of symptoms that can be uh, 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 the result of that type of damage that can then sort of pinpoint for you exactly where the damage has taken place. Okay, so what's gonna happen is somewhere between today and tomorrow, a very busy schedule in here, but you'll be getting your exam. Some of you, in fact, let's see, uh, this afternoon, three of you be taking part one of the exam with me. And then tomorrow, I'm going to encourage you. I think, uh, I think um, Jeff Beeler has sent out to many of uh, people that what we're having tomorrow is the 11th annual Psychology Pedagogy Day. And uh, it has a very, very, uh, 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 it's a six hour program that you can sort of watch via like a webinar type of thing and be presented. And very much in keeping with the psychology doctoral program, which we formed about a year ago, a diversity, equity and inclusion committee that now has 30, faculty, students, and staff working together. Part of this is going to be a part of a, a program 
in terms of student activism and student teaching as it's related to pedagogy. So hopefully uh, some of you can tune in and watch that. But you'll also get uh, part two of the exam and I'll be telling you when you have to return it as a, a Word file. So we'll start off with the Locus Aurelius next uh, uh, Thursday. And then next Thursday, I will also start to tell you things about the paper. So does anybody have any last questions or are all of your brains full and you wanna leave? <laughs> Okay, with that, I'll say I'll see you next Thursday, and I'll see you, a number of you, during the week as I keep giving this part one. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Bye, thank you. Bye.